The American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities is pleased to host today's webinar. For those of you attending your first ASEF webinar, ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the U.S. Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. If it is not your first time to join an ASEF webinar, welcome back. Please know that ASEF is here to support you beyond today's webinar, and we invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org or join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have Alan Lawrence joining us today for this webinar entitled Lessons Learned from Disaster. Mr. Lawrence currently serves as a school security and technology expert. Mr. Lawrence has assisted schools following high profile tragedies, published numerous articles, and often lectures on technology and security planning. His hands on experience working with law enforcement and schools has given him a unique understanding of how a school's design may impact school safety and security. Welcome, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Hello, my name is Al Lawrence. I'm Director of Technology and Security Design, and I will be your presenter today. Before we get going, I just wanted to run quickly through our agenda. Uh, we are going to be discussing quite a, a bit about safety and security in the K-12 environment most importantly is going to be creating a culture of preparedness. One of the most difficult things you have as an administrator or a security director is creating that culture uh, within your school district. The greater challenge you'll have after that is maintaining that level of preparedness. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. We're going to talk about how you can assess vulnerabilities and risk, the types of disasters, both natural and man-made, that we have to deal with in education today. We're also going to discuss some strategies to help improve safety and security. And finally, we're going to conclude with some additional resources that can help you out. When we get to the uh, end of the presentation with the question slide, we will uh, open it up for questions at that time. And keeping questions open for an additional 30 minutes beyond the time frame listed, uh, and you may post questions to the Facebook page for the folks here at ASAF. The culture of preparedness uh, that I speak about requires one big keyword, and that's collaboration. It is not just amongst the administrators and the local staff. Uh, this, of course, is with your local police, fire, EMS, emergency preparedness officials. But it also goes further if you're designing a new building. Collaboration requires the work of your architect, your planners, technology and security consultants. Uh, all of them are going to play a role in helping uh, develop the next building, which hopefully will contribute to that culture. Internally, however, you need to establish a committee uh, that's going to help review and update your safety and security measures. Uh, this committee must be a very diversified committee. Don't try to restrict it just to the principal or the school resource officer or your director of security. This is something that uh, is going to take a very broad spectrum of your staff. You want to make sure you have adopted, reviewed, and you're implementing a multi-hazard emergency operations plan, or EOP. Again, that collaboration with your staff in addition to the local uh, representatives is, is going to be critical in, in helping establish that. And once we've uh, established the emergency operations plan, we're going to be conducting emergency preparedness training for staff and students. Despite all the tragedies that we've faced in the last six months in uh, education in, in the United States, one of the key factors that continues to raise its head is the fact that the staff was prepared, and that preparedness helped save lives. I talked briefly about some of the members of the school personnel that you need to include on that team, and this is just kind of a snapshot list. Uh, in addition to the administrators, the receptionists, the janitorial staff, nurses, counselors, your teachers, uh, and, and the special needs uh, staff also need to be included in this process the school resource officer, and your technology transportation and maintenance directors uh, all should be involved in this process. Each of their departments is going to play a critical role in times of uh, emergency. 
And of course, whatever we decide to invest or whatever we decide to uh, employ for a safety and security measure in our schools, naturally it is going to cost us money, uh, not only for the implementation initially, but also to help maintain that system. So financially, we need to know exactly where we are uh, as a team. One of the tools that's going to help you uh, prepare for this culture is identifying the risks. We face a lot of risks on a daily basis. Uh, our kids face a tremendous amount of risks. So we're going to cover some of those, but before we get into those details, I want to talk about what is risk. Uh, defined is simply the possibility of suffering harm or loss, uh, the danger or probability of loss occurring to one's insured assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. And the terms threats or vulnerabilities in themselves can, can be used intermingled. Uh, a risk, a threat, or a vulnerability. You may hear vulnerability assessment or threat assessment or risk assessment. They can mean sometimes the same thing, but it also depends on what you're looking at. Through vulnerability assessments, you're going to be looking at weaknesses in whatever your uh, security system may be. Uh, risks are going to be the threats that those security systems help deal with, for example. Uh, the role of the risk assessment, it's a, it's a management tool. It's going to provide a roadmap for mitigation and investment. It's going to help establish priorities. And your assessment must continue to evolve. Your risks are always going to be changing. So don't just sit back with a, a canned list of assessment questions and think, well, every year if I just go through that, I'm going to be okay. You always have to be looking at ways to improve that process. The four key steps that you want to consider when performing a risk assessment. First, you need to identify the assets requiring the protection. What is it we're trying to protect? In our schools, there is no doubt that our students and staff uh, are our number one priority, but also our vehicles. If we're a transportation director, our number one priority is our vehicles. If we're the maintenance director, we're looking at the buildings and the grounds. We then has to identify the types of threats or risk to each of those assets. And those, of course, are going to be both man-made uh, and natural. We then have to determine the likelihood of those threats or risks actually occurring. You don't want to invest money in a system to a risk that, although statistically extremely, extremely low in probability, also carries a very little impact. You need to focus on those items that have a high likelihood of occurring and have carry a sufficient impact to your district. Some additional tools to identify or mitigate risk. The Department of Education has resources online that you can use. Uh, your local crime reports and your local authorities. You need to understand the surrounding uh, environment around your school, whether that be a school that's near a transportation hub, an area that has high crime. Uh, those local crime reports can help identify some of the risks that you may not even be aware of. Sexual predators, of course, are always a risk no matter where you are in the United States. So having a system that is installed or in place that helps check the predator database, whether that's through your staff, your school resource officers, uh, your local law enforcement relationships, and there are technological systems out there today that can help do this for you. And lastly is crime prevention through environmental design. SEPTED is a, uh, a design tool that architects and law enforcement personnel uh, use when they're looking at your facilities. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about SEPTED uh, later on in the presentation. I'm going to talk about mitigating risks for new facilities. Uh, you are a district who just passed a bond or you're building a new building through some other financial means. Uh, you need to identify the risks uh, for those buildings. And that comes back to that right team that we just talked about earlier. Um, all the folks from your district your local law enforcement, your architect, your planners, structural engineers, technology and security consultants. Are, does the architect have any familiarity with crime prevention through environmental design? And what types of building materials are we selecting for our facility? Of course, with the recent tragedies in Oklahoma, we are seeing uh, quite a bit of focus on how buildings are constructed. 
And before we can examine ways to mitigate risk for our existing facilities, I cannot stress enough the importance of starting with the assessment process. Again, that risk assessment is going to help you identify and prioritize those issues that you should deal with the most. We talked briefly about emergency operation plans. Uh, EOPs basically they describe the legal basis for emergency management activities for your district. They outline the lines of authority during which emergencies uh, may occur and describe how those actions will be coordinated. During an emergency, communication is, is so critical both before the emergency happens if you have time to prepare such as a natural disaster, during the emergency itself, and then afterwards how do we uh, get the kids to a safe place? How do we reunify them with their parents? Uh, all of those uh, have to be worked out in that emergency operations plans. Again, the EOP includes the concept for preventing and protecting against, but an additional preparing for and responding to and recovering from, from those emergencies. Uh, it also assigns responsibility for carrying out specific actions. Who is going to talk to the press? Who is going to be responsible for the reunification of the parents? What role does the transportation director play in the uh, reunification process? What types of communication systems will be available through our technology department? Are the cell towers down? Are we using two-way radios? And they also help identify additional personnel and equipment. We talked about the transportation director being responsible for the uh, possible reunification of students. Well, it means we have to have bus routes. We need to know the routes our buses can take. Are there additional vehicles that we may have to employ? Uh, what facilities will we use? Will reunification occur somewhere at a school stadium? Will it be a nearby church, uh, the town rec center? Uh, all of these things need to be not only pre-planned, but also coordinated with your emergency responders. The EOP also helps out, uh, outline the procedures to request assistance. Do your two-way radios have the ability to be monitored by your local law enforcement? Can they communicate to you through those radios? Uh, what, sort, what types of uh, mitigation actions can you take to help reduce uh, the threat or the likelihood of the impact of the threat from occurring? Another tool that's available are the audits. Um, Audits provide you that attention to safety and security that's ongoing. It does not stop. It Don't consider it an annual event or once every three years I have to report my findings to the state. Uh, audits are a way of continually uh, trying to self-improve our team and our staff. It is a self-assessment and it's utilizing your own personnel, uh, your staff, your students, your facility managers, your transportation directors, those janitorial folks, all of them are going to be playing a role in an emergency. They have to identify and understand that role to better prepare ourselves for the likelihood of an event occurring. We're going to talk a little bit now about the types of man-made and natural disasters that could befall an educational facility. First we're going to talk about natural uh, disasters. Of course, with the news coming out of Moore, Oklahoma, uh, our attention has been drawn to tornado safety, uh, the structure of our facilities, but there are more natural disasters that we also have to consider during that risk assessment. Uh, tornadoes are one, but lightning. Your technology department is keenly aware of the sensitivity of their electronics. You could easily lose fifty to a hundred thousand dollars of equipment because you don't have uh, proper grounding and bonding installed in your telecommunication rooms. Grounding and bonding does not ensure you from losing any device during a direct lightning strike, but it can help mitigate or reduce the impact from nearby strikes or additional power surges that could be man-made. Hurricanes, folks that live along the coast, you have to prepare your hurricane evacuation. Uh, wildfires are a constant threat in the United States as we see shifting weather patterns that bring drought to some areas of the United States. Earthquakes and tsunamis. Not all thunderstorms produce tornadoes, but they can produce downdrafts, microbursts, or straight line wind damage. For those of us who live along the ring of fire, you have to deal with volcanoes, winter storms, ice storms to the 
to our neighbors to the north, and extreme temperatures. Sometimes extreme heat can play a role in your environmental systems, can play a role in your building. Um, and then, of course, not all of our threats walk on two legs. Uh, we have to deal with the potential threat of wild animals. As our cities and towns expand and new school construction carries the property out into areas that were used to belong to Mother Nature, uh, sometimes Mother Nature still hangs around. And we, all has to, we also need to recognize the fact that a lot of our schools are in residential areas. A lot of residents have pets. You cannot guarantee that the fencing perimeter around your property, if it is shared with your neighbor, is always solid and in the best of shape. So if your perimeter fencing includes neighborhood housing, then your principals and administrators need to be occasionally walking that area. Know who has the dogs. Know what type of dogs they are. And also check the conditions of the fence. Are the neighbors starting to show signs where a dog can get through and into our playground? We've discussed the natural hazards, of course, but let's talk a little bit about the man-made threats. Uh, in addition to criminal activity, including uh, terrorism, uh, we also have to consider our surrounding environment and the likelihood that while the school may not be the immediate target, you may be near an area that could be a high-profile target, and the school could itself suffer from collateral damage from such a, an attack, or you could be involved in a response, uh, caught between a response between local law enforcement and anyone committing uh, an attack against one of those other facilities. Do you have nearby military installations or government agencies? Are there banks or daycare facilities nearby? Daycare facilities have to deal with a constant threat of custody battles, and custody battles and dealing with small children can become very emotional, and you don't know what can happen with parents when they get into these types of, of difficult times. Do your schools live near or house near fuel depots or mass transportation hubs such as airports or bus or rail terminals? Are there hazardous waste sites and chemical plants? Uh, fertilizer storage. The folks in West Texas uh, suffered a, a tremendous uh, disaster in their town when the fertilizer storage area exploded. Uh, several of the district facilities are no longer fit for use and will have to be torn down and replaced. Are there any nearby dams or reservoirs that could fail? What is our plan for evacuation? How quickly will the water reach our property and how quickly can we get our kids out of there? I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the unauthorized, uh, the man-made threats that come in the form of unauthorized campus access. How well is the entrance to your campus monitored, observed, or secured? Do you have an audit system in place? When a visitor arrives at your school, do we check them in? Are we physically checking their ID? Or are we just allowing them to sign in? And once they've signed in, and hopefully that we've checked them in, are we identifying them with a brightly colored lanyard or some sort of badge that clearly pronounces who they are, that they are a visitor, and that our staff can see from a, a distance away? Are we performing any sort of credential exchange where we're keeping their car keys or their driver's licenses that we know when they've uh, exited our building? Or do we have a system in place that once they've checked in, starts an automatic timer that tells us when uh, these folks have left? Mr. Jones has checked in. He's been here an hour. Should have only been here a half hour. We need to check to see what's up with Mr. Jones. Are we controlling access to our doors? Can we monitor all of our doors activities during the day? Are we locking them? Can I walk around the back of your school and come into your cafeteria door between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. because the staff is transitioning quite a bit and they have braced that door open? Can our staff observe the entrance and parking areas to our property? Or are the windows blocked with trees and shrubs And the student access during school hours, on and off campus. Where are people allowed to be during our daily operations? And where are they not allowed to be? Are the surveillance systems that are in place? We have to keep in mind that while they may be preventative in nature, and it may prevent some kids from skateboarding underneath them or, or whatever, 
uh, the primary tool of a surveillance system is evidentiary collection after the fact. Who threw the first punch? Who stole the iPad? Uh, who was roller skating on our benches, etc. A criminal activity, and, and that also includes terrorism. You, you can hear in the news sometimes where people were charged with making terroristic threats, whether that's a bomb threat or I have a gun or some form of communication where they were threatening violence uh, to another person, whether it's inside your school, on the property, uh, or to a student or staff member. What are your policies and procedures in place for dealing with this uh, as it comes up? Do you have a bomb threat checklist? Do you have a checklist in place that helps you identify uh, packages that may arrive that look suspicious? And where are those packages received? And how are they delivered to your school? In this particular news uh, case, we had a father well intended to uh, test his child's school security re uh, response system walked into the office and threatened to make, or threatened the staff saying he had a gun uh, and he was charged with making a terroristic threat. He did not have a gun. Uh, this was uh, roughly one month after the tragedy in Connecticut. So sometimes, again, we don't know how parents are going to respond when it comes to their kids. Intelligence gathering. The, the trust and faith that the students have between the teachers between the student and the school resource officer is critical. A lot of times we hear things uh, that happened, but we don't hear a lot about things that were prevented. And they were prevented because our principals, our administrators, our staff, other students found out about something and reported it to the, to the right folks. Uh, we can also find uh, oftentimes the folks that are about to commit an act like to post certain telltale signs up on social media. So are we aware of what people are saying about our school campus on Facebook or on the various types of social media that are out there today? How in tune are our counselors to our staff? Do we have a dedicated counselor to that campus? Or are we having to share counselors? Industrial disasters, of course, have made the news recently with the West Texas uh, fertilizer explosion. But do you know what is traveling on your highways around your school district? Are any of your campuses near a hazardous material route? You have rail lines that are adjacent to your property and what what is riding in those cars? And do you have any nearby chemical storage processing plants? Again, uh, West really showed the uh, vulnerability of school buildings uh, next to these types of plants. Uh, that explosion was catastrophic to a few of the school buildings that were out there. Fortunately, they happened after hours and none of the students were involved or uh, present at the time. I'm going to talk now about the, we've identified the tools that you can use, the risk assessment process. We've identified the types of risk, both natural and man-made, that you have to consider. But let's talk a little bit about your facility. One of the things we look for is to make sure that the facility itself, what role is the facility playing in school safety and security? Do we have a building that's helping contribute to criminal activity through hiding places, access to the roof? Or do we have a school that is well designed, well thought out, provides clear line of sight to all of the activities going on in and around our building? What type of materials are we using in our facilities today? Are we using cast concrete, reinforced masonry? Do our windows have a glazing or something that helps them make them resistant to impact? Uh, are we giving the occupants the time needed to respond uh, in an emergency situation? Glass accounts for uh, a serious number of injuries during especially uh, wind events, tornadoes, uh, the debris crashing through a, a window, of course. Uh, but also after the emergency. Sometimes people have their shoes taken off of them. Sometimes they forget to put them on, depending on where they're at at the time. Uh, and you have to walk through that. So again, that injuries can still occur even after the storm has passed. Uh, schools today are designed with increased glazing for daylighting. Uh, there has been strong correlation between the amount of daylighting and education. 
and, and schools and teachers tend to favor uh, having daylight in their facilities. We also need to make sure, though, that we're providing some safe areas away from that glass. Uh, do we have interior spaces that students can uh, shelter or take refuge uh, during a, a tornado or, or another event where we need to get them away from the windows? And if we have existing windows, can we consider the use of resistant glazings or uh, applications? Maybe we can't afford to replace all of our windows, but what can we do to currently reinforce them? Now, there's been a lot of talk, of course, about uh, shelters, shelter in place, uh, but I want to make sure that we're all very clear that there are some distinguishing characteristics between what we consider a safe room, a shelter, uh, and, and it really comes down to code. Safe rooms and shelters used to be used as, as mixed terms. One, one almost meant the other. However, a safe room today has specific FEMA requirements that it must be designed to. A safe room offers the most near absolute protection from extreme wind events, whereas a shelter is going to definitely withstand certain wind events, is not meeting the same criteria as a safe room. The FEMA standards meet or exceeds the ICC 500 guidelines that cover shelter construction. And those FEMA guidelines includes FEMA 320 and 361 for guidance. You can access those from the FEMA websites. Those are PDFs that are available. But regardless of what you're planning or thinking of doing, you must always make sure you've checked with your local and state authorities to make sure all local and state uh, applicable codes are being met. Shelters, as I mentioned, uh, require uh, being constructed to the ICC 500 requirements. That is a requirement of the 2009 uh, International Building Code. Uh, these design requirements uh, are for wind speed resistance, and it's based on geography. Where are your facilities in the United States? If you're located in what they know as Tornado Alley, from Texas to the northwest corner of Pennsylvania, um, you have different wind speed requirements than Utah or Colorado. And whether you're looking to build a shelter, a hardened facility, a safe room, you must have the involvement of licensed structural engineers. Safe rooms themselves, these are self-contained rooms. They can hold a large number of students for a limited time. They are not intended as a shelter would be, uh, like a hurricane shelter, where you're looking at a long duration of stay. Uh, Extreme storms offer little time to move students and staff. Depending on where your school is located, you may not have an emergency siren nearby. Does the staff have a NOAA weather radio? A lot of times today, our staff, when they see the darkening and threatening skies, they can get on the internet and check the radar themselves and see what's going on. But you may not have a whole lot of warning. So where are these areas of shelter uh, are these hardened facilities, are these safe rooms located in my building? How quickly can I get students and staff with disabilities or other access and functional needs? How quickly can I get those kids to a place where they're going to be safer? And the difference between a tornado shelter and hurricane shelter is really about duration. Uh, in tornado shelters, we usually have little advance warning but we are not staying in that area for very long, usually until after the storm passes and the all clear is given. A hurricane shelter, you have typically a long preparation time, sometimes days, maybe extending into a week, and they need to be equipped for long durational stay. You're going to have citizens in your community may be using your school, the Red Cross may be using your school gymnasium as a shelter from the storm. So items to consider for shelters would include making sure you've got backup electrical power, lighting, emergency lighting, battery-operated lighting, communication devices, whether they're two-way radios, cellular systems will likely be interrupted uh, in these large storms. So are we using landlines or other forms of communication? Do we have emergency go kits and provisions or backup metal su medical supplies? Do we have an AED, the defibrillator device, near uh, areas of shelter. 
A lot of school districts will put an AED device near, near their gymnasium area. Uh, so this needs to be either brought inside or we need to have a, uh, a spare or a portable system that we make sure we've got on hand. And any types of equipment that we do have on hand, we need to make sure we're checking the backup equipment regularly. AED batteries, for example, have to be replaced on a continual basis. Make sure your emergency lighting and your batteries are still functioning. Other shelter design considerations you need to keep in mind is the area large enough to keep order and for us to supervise the students. Uh, can this area remain clear for use when needed? Or over time, will it turn into a, a storage room? And when we need it the most, we can't even get into it. Can we get the doors to open inward so people can still open the doors and exit even after the storm and debris is likely to block the door? Now, those doors cannot replace the use of exterior doors that have to swing out to meet local and national fire code for egress. And any time you're looking at taking the swing of a door in, you need to make sure you're consulting with your local authorities, your authorities having jurisdiction, or AHJs, your fire marshals, uh, your architects, uh, and see what kind of doors and where can we place them. And how will those doors be secured? What are the protocols on when to shut them? Communicate with the outside. Do we have a window? How large is that window going to be? Is it reinforced? How can we open them? When are we going to open them? If we've shut the doors and we see kids and a staff member who are trying to get in, who's going to make the call? We also must consider openings like our doorways and duct penetrations with meandering pathways. This makes it more difficult for flying debris just to simply penetrate and come straight through. Intentionally hardened gyms may be able to meet all of those considerations, but again, that's going to involve a process with the architect, the structural engineers, and your local building codes officials, as well as your emergency first responders. If you're designing a new facility, we talked a little bit about some of the materials that you may use. Are you designing with superior wall and roof assemblies? Again, that reinforced masonry, insulated concrete forms, lightweight concrete roof decks, uh, wall and deck assemblies, are they secured together to provide you the best possible diaphragm when the winds and the uplift come through? Have we considered using laminated glass for safety along the exterior windows? And what about our existing facilities? When we look at our risk assessment, when we walk those facilities, we're looking for things that could, could lead to potential emergencies or disasters for us. Are the gas lines protected in our parking lots with bollards? Or in this case, are they completely exposed to a vehicle that has the gas line three feet away from the fourth grade class wing? Our building entrances. How many points of entry do we have on and off of our campuses? For elementaries, this can usually be very tightly regulated and controlled. But for high schools where we have students transferring back and forth between buildings, uh, this becomes a, a greater risk. Where's our trash bins located? How easy is it for me to climb on top of your trash bin or the wall that surrounds the trash bin and climb onto the roof of your facility? If someone were to come along and set fire to the trash bin, could that spread to your facility? Are all your trash bins located in an observable area approximately 150 feet away from your building? You know, are they far enough away to where they're not going to become a problem for us? Our building ventilation, our intakes, are they in concealed locations? Or are they in areas that can be tampered with? We have had people remove the ventilation ducts from school roofs, gain access to the ceiling areas, and proceed to perform a break and entering at that point, came in through the roof. Uh, all of our exterior electrical panels and HVAC shutoffs, where are they located around the exterior of our building, and how easy is it for someone just to come along and throw the switch and interrupt power service? And finally, we're going to talk about a design protocol, crime prevention through environmental design. This is something between your local law enforcement and your architect that you need to be focusing on during a building's design, or even when performing a risk or threat assessment. SEPTED has four key principles that I want to touch briefly on. Territorial reinforcement, natural surveillance, natural access control, and we cannot overlook maintenance. Territorial reinforcement is just that. It's about establishing a delineation between your public and private space, whether that's passive barriers, natural landscaping, elevation changes. 
we have perimeter fencing and what types of perimeter fencing are we using? Do we have clear and concise signage along our perimeter? This facility under surveillance, no trespassing. Visitors, are, how well and easy is it for a visitor to show up in the morning when you have school kids coming and going from cars and buses to get to a parking area? Or are they going to be looking around and be distracted trying to find a place that you need them to park? It's an example of territorial fencing. In this particular fence, we have wrought iron. It's very decorative. It does its job. However, the height of it is not going to keep a 15-year-old from trying to jump it. And when they jump it, they have a likelihood of being injured. How easy is it for us to gain access through your territorial fencing? You invest the money in these uh, perimeter fencing systems, but then someone can easily put their hand through on the other side and unlatch the gate, close it behind them, and you never knew we were there. And as we talked about, not all of our threats walk on two legs. Sometimes Mother Nature and wildlife come calling. These two young ones showed up on the school playground, uh, only to learn that this is actually a common sight. If you go about 50 feet down from this fence, you'll find some additional fencing, but it's of a low height that the deer were able to jump or just walk around. The fencing was not continuous. And clear and concise signage. There is no doubt that this is the main entrance into the facility. What you do not see are the two other signs that were placed from the visitor parking up to the building that clearly guided me to where I needed to be and more importantly where you needed me to go. And of course we talked about maintenance. Maintenance, if we're going to invest the money in systems, HVAC, if we're going to invest in protecting these systems, we have to maintain it. If we feel that this HVAC system is important enough to have top guard of barbed wire over our chain link fence, then we've just, we've lost that sense of protection because we haven't repaired the fence when it was damaged. Another principle was natural surveillance, direct line of sight. This is the ability for our staff, our teachers, our students to be able to see their surrounding environment and to be able to respond to a threat. We want to avoid vestibules with hidden approaches. How soon can we see a visitor walking up to our building? Do we have hiding areas and blind corners in our schools that during class change provide areas where teenagers can do what teenagers will do? Is our staff in those classrooms at the end of the hall coming out to check and see what is going on during the class change? Are our stairwells aligned directly with the hallway or do we have to make a left or right turn? That's that blind corner and that blind alley. That traffic flow is going to create a problem there where students are coming and going, running into each other. Also consider the location of the sun when placing the office windows. If the office is situated where the eastern sun or the western sun create a blind area, the staff tends to close the blinds and they've just blinded themselves from being able to see outside. Have we coordinated our vegetation design? Have we planted trees where the surveillance cameras are going to be? Have we planted shrubs that are going to grow to eight to nine feet tall? Are we maintaining that vegetation? Where are the ancillary buildings? Are uh, field houses, our concession stands, those additional buildings that you tend to find on high schools, are they in areas where we can easily observe them? They in turn will create their own hiding areas, their own alleyways that sometimes can also promote criminal activity. This is a cafeteria that had a tremendous number of columns in it that made it quite difficult for the uh, high school SRO to maintain a natural surveillance over the entire area. Same floor pattern, Next high school, columns are removed, staff has easy natural surveillance of this system, and we can watch this entire area with only four surveillance cameras. This is an example of vegetation that has gone out of control. The staff behind those windows cannot see. We also create hiding areas when we let our vegetation get go growing between the buildings, like you see in the photo on the left. Natural access control is the third uh, principle of SEPTED. This is our driveways. How easy is it for us to access the property? From the fencing and perimeter, to the driveways, the parking, to the sidewalks, to your front door, to your classroom door. Do we have reinforced planters, barriers, or bollards that prevent a vehicle from jumping the curb and striking students who may be standing up there for pickup and drop off? Are all of our doors locked? Are we using some vegetation to form a natural barrier? 
or to limit the approaches around the property line of our facility? Do we have controlled vestibules with transaction windows? If we do that, then we need to take into consideration any acoustical challenges that those areas may present. How easy is it for our staff to communicate with the person on the other side of that window? Do our classroom doors have intruder function? Can we secure the classroom door from the inside? Do we keep our doors in a ready state of lock? Or can I just open any door while walking through your halls and have access uh, to your class? The restroom entrances, do they have doors upon, uh, on their exterior? Or do you have an S-type entrance like you see at the airports where you can walk in but not be heard? If a student or staff or somebody is in that restroom doing something they shouldn't be and they hear that door, then you've just given them the edge. They have the advantage. They have the early warning. And what's inside those restrooms? Do we have hard ceilings where we cannot get guns or drugs placed above them? Or do we have lay-in ceilings, the acoustical tiles? How easy is it for us to gain access to the roofs? This is an example of the restroom door. And of course, when you stand on one of the, the toilets inside the stall, you can easily gain access to the lay-in ceiling above. In the photo on the left, you see a water pipe going up a three-story building. The students went up to this flat roof, which you see on the right. They shimmied up the pipe the entire way, totally ignored the maintenance ladder that was available on the lower side of the building, and they decided they were going to play football on top of a three-story high school. This presented a tremendous safety hazard to the students, but also to the local authorities who had to respond and uh, had to make an apprehension. This is an example of the trash uh, storage area. We have our dumpsters. We have a solid block wall around them, but they're all within too close of a proximity to our school where we can gain access to the roof. On this particular campus, college students were using that as a way to get on top of the roof, and then they were performing potato stack races down the other side of the building. And then lastly, there's been a lot of focus on controlled entrances. Uh, this is just one example of a controlled entrance to where the receptionist can clearly see all the way through both sets of doors out to the approaches uh, that govern the access to the building. The doors on either side of the vestibule are all secured with card access. The only way in and out is into the office. The office also has control over the personnel doors that lead to the secure side of the vestibule. So an individual cannot just simply walk into the office calmly, create a, a violent act, harm the receptionist, and then gain access, or just breeze past the receptionist and gain access to the rest. That cannot happen if it is designed and if it is uh, used properly. This is just a list of some of the resources that are available for folks to use uh, if you have any questions. And right now, that concludes my presentation. I do want to open it up for questions that we may have. And, and one of the first questions that came in, what are some low, no-cost safety features a school can implement? Um, you know, some of the simple things we talked about, the visitor ID, the use of the lanyard, the brightly colored lanyards, how are we checking in our visitors? Uh, how aware is our staff when they're checking them in? If we're just allowing them to sign in without even looking at credentials, then, you know, the problem is us. Uh, so we need to make sure that our staff is looking at those uh, uh, at their credentials, is signing them in, is documenting the time that they've come in. Now, on certain days when you have sport activities, you have field day, PTA parties, Christmas parties, and that sort of thing, a lot of schools are going to open up their doors a lot more. But you counter that with an increased staff presence. Your staff has to know, okay, we're going to be an open facility, do we have any parents that have custody issues? Do we have any parents that have known to show here and create problems? Who are they? What do they look like? Where are they likely to go? That sense of awareness comes at, at no cost to you. What tech infrastructure should be in place uh, to enhance security? From a technology standpoint, and we talked about the involvement of the technology director, if you're planning on implementing a new digital or IP-based surveillance system, if you're going to remove an analog system that may be already in place in older surveillance, you have to involve that technology director. 
do we have the right cabling infrastructure in place? Do we have the right amount of bandwidth in between our telecommunication rooms to get the time-sensitive video to where it needs to be? Do we have the switches, the electronic equipment in place that can provide power to the cameras? Or do I need to have uh, a dedicated power supply uh, for those cameras because I don't have the money to buy new switch gear? All of those are going to impact your technology department. Are you placing surveillance cameras in areas where you don't have exterior illumination or the lighting is poor? The reduced quality you have in your lighting, the reduced quality you'll have in the video image. But also your technology, where are you going to be storing your audio or your uh, video surveillance footage? Are you going to be storing that on each campus? Or do you have your cameras reporting the information back, sending that information back to a centralized location? a network operations center. What kind of fiber optic backbone do we have between the buildings? Is it our fiber? Are we leasing it? Do we have a lot of construction in the area that could create a risk hazard? If our fiber backbone is, uh, is broke, if it's aerial, is it struck by a vehicle or pulled down or blown down? All the video surveillance footage is lost. Now some cameras do come equipped with the ability uh, to have a video uh, storage card on them usually don't hold a lot of information. Uh, one of the other questions that came in, is it more cost effective to include the infrastructure at the design phase or in a retrofit? It is much more cost effective to have that infrastructure in place when you're designing a new wireless access points, your voice and data network, all of that, you should be planning that at the time of design. If you have to come back you're going to see an increase in labor costs because the contractors have to get above the ceilings. There's an increased risk and in damage to the ceilings themselves or to property inside the rooms. So try to get as much as you possibly can done uh, in the upfront. If you're looking at the types of cabling, whether or not it's a Category 5E or a Category 6, for those of you who are technology-orientated uh, folks, you need to take in consideration what am I gaining by using a CAT6 cable over a CAT5E? Uh, do I want to go to CAT6 enhanced? You know, Think about the life of that infrastructure versus the life of that building. Also, don't overlook your electronic devices that sit at the ends of those cables. Uh, if we invest a lot of money in our infrastructure but don't put it into the processor speed or don't put it into the, the back planes of those switches, uh, they're going to create a bottleneck for us. Bottlenecks are not good when it comes to dealing in time-sensitive applications like video or voice uh, applications. We cannot recreate that data once it's lost. If you could post any additional questions you may have to the Facebook page uh, of the ACEF uh, personnel, and I do appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. ACEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter and our participants for joining our webinar today. We hope that you took this opportunity to learn from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and will use this content to advance your knowledge on educational facilities. Please join us again soon for upcoming ASEF events. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please call if the ASAP staff can assist you in any way. Have a great day. Thank you.